Hello, everybody.、Uh, welcome to the pilot episode of True Words, a Shingon Buddhist podcast. I'm Andrew. And hi, everyone. This is Reverend Kosho Finch,、uh, minister of the Khoisan Shingon School of Buddhism. <laughs> and today's topic,、uh, we'll be covering some fundamental Buddhist ideas like the Four Noble Truths and Uh, basic Buddhist practices as well. I guess the first question that comes up is so, what is Buddhism? What is the purpose of Buddhism? What is this entire tradition about? Well, I think there's、um, probably a hundred different answers to that question.、Um, but I think it's good to start off with what, what is anything, right? Anything. Um, that humans come up with is usually a reaction to a problem that they identified, whether it's a tool,、um, a method,、um, a new outlook.、Um, someone at some point identified a problem and tried to come up with an answer. So I think、um, at the base level, maybe the very beginning, we have.、Uh, Someone just like us who identifies a problem and sets out to try to find a solution to that problem. And how that problem was identified and the solution that、um, that person came up with was unique among the many ways to react to this problem. And the tradition over Almost 25, 2600 years,、um, it's going to be known as Buddhism.、Um, so I, I kind of like to think of it as a method, a, maybe you can even say a, a proof that's testable that you can、um, work with and determine for yourself if there is truth to it. So, what is the Problem that Buddhism tries to deal with? I think the problem for the Buddhist outlook would be if someone's not familiar with Buddhism and、um, is familiar with other religions, would find that the initial problem is a lot different than、um, what they would expect. So the question I always get、um, from people when they encounter Buddhism is well, what's your holy book? And、so they assume that just like Christianity or Islam, there is going to be a single text. So there's a lot of assumptions、um, from the very beginning. So Buddhism, I think the starting point is、um, very different. And I think the starting point really is you know, what's the main obstacle that we have as a human being? And、um, being able to actually identify that problem、um, was something unique in the way it was. Identified was unique. And so the Buddha pointed out that the main problem, usually in English,、um, term suffering, which sounds very negative or maybe even depressing.、Um, but the Sanskrit word dukkha、uh, really probably refers to something more akin to、uh, things being unsatisfactory, that we feel stress or at times are not satisfied. With the way our lives are going. And I think if we put it that way, it's something much more、um, personal for all of us. There's always times where we are dissatisfied. There's always times when we think things aren't going the way we want them to.、Um, and there's always times that we have stress. So that was really the Buddha's first,、um, first observation and how he observed it. Was unique to him.、So、as a prince in India, he realized well, no matter how powerful I am, no matter、um, what kind of special things I have or riches or、uh, good food, I still feel this dissatisfaction or I still feel this, maybe in our modern terms, we may say existential angst.、Um, who am I? You know, where am I going?、Um, where does it all lead? That kind of feeling. So, the Buddha termed this、um, what we would classify in the 
sort of the basic teaching of Buddhism, the first of the Four Noble Truths of the uh, truth of suffering or the truth of dukkha, this feeling of things being unsatisfactory, stressful, not ultimately satisfying to us. So you mentioned the Four Noble Truths. So seeing as that leads into the Four Noble Truths, which is one of the major Buddhist concepts, uh, can you go a bit deeper into what the Four Noble Truths are? I'll try. I'll say in my experience, um, I spent a lot of years when I was younger studying Buddhism, and the Four Noble Truths were always there, and I glossed over it um, too many times to count. And now I find that uh, I can come back to it and find a lot of depth and a lot of nuance that I didn't initially see. Um, so the first of the Four Noble Truths is this idea of dukkha. And even the word dukkha we could probably talk about for an entire evening. But um, the idea that sometimes even small things um, can build up to become something that um, can really drive us crazy. Um, the image in Sanskrit of dukkha is uh, sort of like the squeaky wheel, something that, um, you know, in small doses uh, is not a problem for us. But over time, if you take a long journey, uh, the squeaky wheel on the car or the wagon um, can really start to sort of drive you crazy. Uh, so we find that the quality or nature of things uh, no matter what they are, over time, um, with either too much exposure to it or um, exposure to different types of things, we become dissatisfied. So the Buddha said, ultimately, that's our, our initial starting point for a lot of our problems. And he talks about the problem of being human in sort of very broad brushstrokes. So these are very broad categories. The way we experience it is going to be um, different for all of us. Some things that you or I might find very pleasurable, somebody else may find really intolerable. So the nature of it is, is going to be different. So I think that's where, um, in terms of a broad category, um, it, it's, it's very broad and it's open to a lot of interpretation. Um, so once you identify a problem, um, the Buddha, I think, is very practical. So the next of the Four Noble Truths is, well, what's the cause? Um is there a cause? Um, how, did, how did we get here? And so the second of the Four Noble Truths is, okay, there is a cause to this suffering, which is actually an important sort of way place or a stopping over point if we're going to attempt to fix a problem. We need to know if there's a cause and if it's a the cause is something that we as human beings can actually um, tackle. So I think a lot of times if we go uh, through history, even in maybe even our, our personal lives, we may feel that the cause of our problem is beyond our understanding or beyond our control. We have a feeling like, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, and so I think right away, the Buddha first identifies the cause um, and is telling us that there is something that, that we can do, that there is a cause to this situation. And... Um, meaning there is a solution. So it's not leaving us uh, hanging. And then knowing that there's a cause, we say, okay, now sort of what's the next step? So the third of the Four Noble Truths is the Buddha further reassuring us saying, okay, there is this cause and it is possible to change it. And I think that's a very, you know, even more important thing. A lot of... Um, uh, human culture has settled on fate or that things are beyond our control um, or, you know, outside of our means to change. And right away, um, the sort of the basic foundation of all Buddhist teaching is this very helpful or hopeful message that um, life is not absurd or meaningless, that there's actually um, something that we can do so that this cause is something that can change. And finally, I would say the fourth of the noble truths is probably what everyone's wondering, okay, how do I change it? Um, so the Buddha says there is a path towards um, changing it, 
towards changing our lives and not having this feeling of uh, dissatisfaction. And that path is really what the Buddhist teaching is. It's a set of instructions, uh, a very broad set of instructions for many, many different types of circumstances, different types of people, um, of how do we actually change this very basic experience of being a human being and feeling this dissatisfaction. So probably um, when compared to other world religions, this is a um, different perspective, is a different starting point. It's not asking you right away to have faith. It's not asking you uh, right away to uh, believe in anything. It's an actual testable hypothesis, I guess you could say. It's a testable theory. You can sit down and work it out. You can mull it over. You can give it thought and decide for yourself if it's something that is actually possible. And I think that part is really important because um, the hardest thing of any religion is uh, faith. And it's hard because that's the one thing you can't teach. You can teach people about religion. You can teach people about a particular method. Um, but having uh, faith in a process or faith in a method um, is something that people either have or they don't. But the, in my mind anyway, the, the biggest thing that makes Buddhism different is the uh, method is something you can teach. And most of Buddhist practice is all about the method. And I think that's why um, when the Buddha laid out these Four Noble Truths, uh, the fourth one is this path. Okay, how do we get started? What do we actually do? And um, it's laid out for well, more books than anyone could read in their lifetime, but many, many methods and, and many different ways of approaching it. So I think we all have kind of a method that resonates with us, whether that be uh, meditation and then even within meditation there are so many kinds on loving kindness on the breath uh, and then aside from that there are methods like chanting and uh, doing prostrations or bows to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas there are so many practices how do we know that uh, this is a practice that we should continue or uh, how do we pick a practice that's a good question. I think um, traditionally you were probably stuck with whatever was the major practice in your country. Um, one of the benefits we have in uh, North America, uh, Europe, other places, is we have almost every Buddhist tradition available to us. Um, so if you're in the United States, in any major metropolitan area, you're probably going to have... Um, you know, if not a handful or more different Buddha centers that you could um, visit. And thanks to this great thing called the Internet, you can reach out and sample uh, a wide variety of uh, different methods. So I think that's good. I think it's a it's an encouraging change that we have access to a lot of different methods. And I would encourage people to to try different ones. Um so just like clothing or something along those lines, right? It's not a one size fits all. The Buddha did lay out different um, instructions for different scenarios for different people. And um, it's good to do a little window shopping. But I think what you'll hear from most every teacher is eventually you should settle on one for a while and put some energy into practicing one method um, to try to get some results. And um, one that's very popular, of course, in the United States is meditation. And there's within that many different forms of meditation. Um, I don't think any one is better than another one. I think the question really is just which one is good for you. Um, so I would really encourage people to um, put energy into a couple different methods and then find one that they think they like or resonates with them and, you know, try it out for three, six months or a couple years and uh, see if they 
make progress. Definitely. So, we've covered the basics of the Four Noble Truths, um, going into that little part about practice. And then, before we close up for the day, is there any other uh, concept that you feel uh, anybody who is new to Buddhism should definitely know about? I guess I would just go back to meditation as a whole. We, I think in the West, there's a lot of focus on the benefits of meditation. And as a scientifically minded culture, we like to think a lot about the scientifically verifiable benefits to meditation. Um, you know, reduce stress or lowered heart rate or lower incidence of, of hypertension or different diseases. There are a lot of uh, practical benefits that have been studied uh, about meditation. All of those things are good. Um, they're very beneficial side effects, but there is a long, long tradition in Buddhism where that really wasn't the goal. Um, I'm sure the meditators enjoyed those, those side effects, but um, we're really trying to understand ourselves at a deeper level, really trying to observe our inner functions, our inner deeply ingrained habits, and to change those so that our life changes, the quality of our life changes, the quality of our relationship changes. And um, I think that's more difficult to study on a scientific level, but probably more valid than maybe more important than those other benefits from meditation. Um, so I would probably like to just uh, keep people focused on what the Buddhist teaching has traditionally been focused on which is, um, you know, really seeing true change in the individual, in the person, making ourselves more compassionate, more open to others, um, more aware of the suffering and experience of other people and the benefits that that has for us as being a human being. And that that's really one of the main antidotes, you could say, to some of the problems that we experience both on an individual level and on a societal level. So um, those things are, there are fewer books written about that. There are fewer books uh, on Buddhism um, in a popular area of your local bookstore about um, the benefits of uh, feeling more connected to um, you know your neighbors. But that is uh, really the thing that, uh, monks and nuns throughout the Buddhist tradition for millennia have been seeking. Um, and the scientific aspects are more of a new uh, Western perspective. I think both are good, but I would just encourage people not to lose sight of the uh, the traditional purpose. Gotcha, definitely. So, uh, just, this is the first episode Uh and I was just wondering, what other topics do you have in mind that our uh, audience can look forward to in the near future? Well, I'd really like to explore, um, of course, if people have questions that they'd like to hear us talk about, that would be good. But also explore some of the, um, in my experience with Buddhism, you know, what the misconceptions have been um, when people have either walked into a Buddhist temple for the first time the things they see that they may not understand. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the Four Noble Truths, uh, when I first came into contact with them, always seemed uh, very simple, but I found a lot of depth there. So I think it's a topic we can return to, and there's plenty of um, uh, there's plenty of fuel there to keep us going for quite a long time. But uh, there's there's a tremendous amount of um, topics, even just from the number of different Buddhist traditions, different uh, historical developments within Buddhism. So I think if we can touch on some of those from time to time, that would be really great. Awesome. Uh, so thank you for having this, uh, Kosho Sensei. Um, and thank you to all of you online for listening.
and supporting this podcast. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate you uh, suggesting this, and uh, I look forward to more episodes in the future. Thank <laughs> you.